Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read just verse 19, but we're going to go all the way down through verse 29. Right? 19 through 29, but we're just going to read the one verse to get started tonight. <clears throat> Galatians 3, verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Father, thank you for being here with us tonight and teaching us and giving us the Holy Spirit to learn. We pray, Father, that we've uh, uh, done uh, uh, the job of interpreting properly this passage of Scripture. Some of these Scriptures are very difficult. And we pray that you'll lead us by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, help us to remember these. some of these things are very simple things that we already know. We know we're not saved by works, by the law or anything. And most of us here know that. But Lord, you keep repeating that over and over, so it must be very important for us to be reminded of it. We ask you now to be with us as we go through this service, and may we give the honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, verse 19, employment of the law. The purpose of the law is the is the name of my message tonight, the purpose of the law. We most of us know that already, uh, what the purpose of the law is, but let's listen to it again as the Lord uh, gives it to us in these verses. Employment of the law. Verse 19, wherefore the law? Wherefore then serveth the law? Wherefore the law? Why the law? Why is there even a law? If we're saved by grace through faith, why is there a law? What service is the law? What benefit is the law? Well, the Bible tells us right there in verse 19, it was added because of transgressions. It was added because of transgressions. The law was added because people were sinners. And they didn't realize how sinful they really are. I was reading um, some history of this morning in the office there, and I was reading after so this uh, uh, saint, you know, uh, in Christian history or the history of Christianity. They call it the church history. It's really not. But anyway, Christian history, I was reading it, and, and he was talking about, uh, he's, he was a philosopher. He's what they call a Christian philosopher. And he was uh, talking about how that he uh, is worth nothing. I said, well, that's pretty good as a, as a philosopher to say that because philosophers don't usually say that. And he was talking about... <clears throat> how little he is in the presence of God and all like that. And uh, that's what the Jews needed to know. They needed to know not only that they were sinners, but they were bad sinners. And that's the problem with, uh, with many people, especially in our country. We don't want to admit how bad we are. Because we're pretty bad inside of God, aren't we? I mean, we're really bad. A lot worse even than we want to think about in our own minds. Now, it was added, and I will talk about that in a few minutes, but they only had a promise. Uh, to mediate between them and God, but didn't know their wickedness. They didn't know how weak they were and how wicked uh, they were. So the law was added. Now, you can try to turn to these passages. I have two passages I'm going to read to you. If you want to go to Romans 7, that whole chapter is, uh, deals with this, about the law, and about, part, and, and about the same thing as Galatians 3 and, uh, and 4 are talking about. In verse 12 of Romans 7, it says, Wherefore... Uh, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin. Okay, so I've done something, but is it wrong or is it right? You know, uh, philosophers are talking about that all the time. What's right and what's wrong? You know, how do we know something is right and how do we know something is wrong? Somebody says, well, it, it, it's just what people, that's what people know. It's either right or it's wrong. No, we don't just know that, do we? No. There has to be a standard somewhere. And so God laid down the law for the Jew to have a standard so they would know that this is a sin and that's not a sin, you know. And it says that it will appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. The law is good. Nothing wrong with the law. That sin by the commandment might become You'll love this. Exceeding sinful. Exceeding sinful. Oh, yeah, sure, I made a mistake. Or, yeah, I did. I sinned. Yeah, I lied. Or I did this or that or the other. But I don't realize how exceeding sinful it really is. See, but if we sin before God, if you sin before me, it's a sin. But it's not as bad as you sin before God. You sin before God. It's exceeding sinful. First Timothy 1.9. 
Paul here talking, of course, to Timothy. He says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. God didn't make the law for a righteous man. But for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for unholy and profane, the murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, and manslayers, for the whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for man-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, I'm glad he didn't mention all of them because we'd still be reading it 10 years from now. Uh, but, I mean, this is bad stuff. That's what the law was written for, for people, for bad people. Now, it goes on to say, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, remember, the promise was made to Abraham. You remember that? 430 years before the law ever came. Uh, and the seed here is Christ. Now, in chapter 3, if you want to go back to verse 16, Galatians 3, 16, and look at that verse again, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, And to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And so till the seed should come, till Christ comes, that is, the law made people sinful, and it makes sin appear as sin until the seed comes. And that's important. So the law was given to be a force until Jesus came in the fullness of time. We'll talk about that over in chapter 4, verse 4, uh, where it says that in the fullness of time God sent his forth his son. And we'll talk about that then. Then, when the seed comes, every jot and tittle of the law will be fulfilled. And that's very important to know, isn't it? Jesus didn't just come and die for our sins. He came and fulfilled Scripture. He fulfilled uh, the law. What the law could not do, the Bible says, what the law could not do, God sending His only Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So see, the law equals sin. But Christ got rid of sin. And... So that's why the, the, uh, that the Lord came. The, more, the, the ceremonial law was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross because he was the Lamb of God that uh, was slain before the foundation of the word, world and the, son, uh, and the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's who he was. And he came and he died as the Lamb and, and shed his blood, sort of like the Lamb that they killed uh, in Israel, you know, every time they had... Some, some time to do that, and they did it quite often. Someone tried to count up how many lambs it took uh, to kill in one year for them to do all their ceremonial law, and it was a whole lot. I can't remember. It was like, I don't know, 20,000 or something like that. So they had to have sheep herders all the time. They had, had a lot of sheep and goats and ox and so on like that. But the ceremonial law, which was that ceremony they went through to kill the lamb and, and uh, sprinkle the blood and all of that, that was fulfilled on the cross. The moral law, which is thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, all of those, that was fulfilled when Jesus lived his perfect life. So all of the law was fulfilled. The moral law and the ceremonial law. It was all fulfilled in Christ. The one seed and the promise given to Abraham looked forward to that seed and the, and the law that was given 430 years later looked forward to the, that seed coming. The moral law also is to be kept out of love to Christ for those of us who are saved. The moral law is still here. Uh, let's read a, two or three verses on that. Matthew five seventeen in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, we all know that. Romans 3 in verse 31 says, Do we then make void the law through faith? You mean when I believe in the Lord, the law is no good? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. You know, you couldn't keep the law before you were saved. Now you can actually keep the law and bring glory to God through the law. You can actually not steal, not lie, not commit adultery, and you can actually bring praise to God because it's all done by Him, by the grace of God. Because the Bible says, you know, that He works everything in and through us. And that's why we can bring glory to God. Now, Romans 6, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So, we're not under the law for condemnation. 
But we are under the law to serve the Lord. But it's different because now we have a new life. And then it goes on in that verse and says, ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. And I don't, I, quite honestly, I don't know how that happened. I don't know what happened uh, specifically about that. But the Bible does mention that in at least two more uh, verses in the Bible. Hebrews 2.2 2 says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward, so somehow the angels had something to do with with bringing forth the law. Now, I know John said that the law came by Moses, and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I know that. But the angels had something to do with that. I don't know. The Bible does not explain that to us. In Acts 7.53, it says, Who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. I, I don't know what that means. All I know is it's true. <laughs> the law, they received the law by the dispensation of angels. Of angels. Now let's go to verse 20 now in Galatians 3. It says, Now a, me a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Does that make any sense to you? The mediator, a mediator is not a mediator of one. A mediator is a person that brings two people together, either to introduce them or to uh, solve a difference between the two of them. And so that's what a mediator does. When God gave a promise to Abraham, there was no mediator. God just gave the promise to Abraham. There was no mediator between him and Abraham. Uh, there was between God and Israel when the law came because Moses was the mediator. Do you understand that? But there's no mediator between God and Abraham because the Bible just says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So there's no mediator. He didn't have to listen to anybody else. He didn't have to, didn't have to serve anybody else. You know, it, didn't, it wasn't anything like that at all. Um, God gave promise immediately to Abraham. In Hebrews 6.13 it says, For when God made promise to Abraham because he could not swear by a greater, he swore by himself. So God is the mediator. He's the only mediator there is. There is. But you have to remember that there's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and they all had to agree together to do what they did with Abraham. But God is one. That's what he says. God is one. He's the only one needed to give the promise to Abraham. There's no, other, there's no mediator needed between God and Abraham because he just gave him a promise. That's all. And you know that's the way grace is. Now, when God executes grace in us, there has to be a mediator because Jesus is that mediator. But grace just comes from God himself. God is just one. He doesn't need a man except Jesus, and he's the exceptional man. <laughs> and so God is one. And he's the one who is three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant, which is the law, but Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. Now look at verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily, which means truly, righteousness should have been by the law. So let's think this through. The law was given 430 years after the promise to Abraham. And if the law were against the promises of God, then the law would succeed it and take the place of it. So it looks, when you just look at that on a diagram, it looks as if God gave the promise here, and then the law came and replaced it. But the law did not replace the promise. And the Bible is very clear about that. But the, the law was added to the promise. Because, you see, Abraham believed God, was counting him for righteousness, but Israel did not understand, once they became a nation, they did not understand how sinful they were. And the law was not given to the whole world. It was given to Israel for them to know how exceeding sinful they are. They thought the Gentiles were the worst people in the, in the world. At all. I mean, they thought they were just the, the dirt, nothing but dirt. 
They called them all kinds of names, excluded them from everything, wouldn't have fellowship with them, nothing. But Israel, because of that, Israel, you know, no doubt thought, oh, look who we are. You know, God brought us together, God delivered us from Israel, blah, 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 you know, on all of those things. But God wanted them to know, look, you are just as sinful as that Gentile over there. No exception to that. No exception to sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so eventually, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles are going to be involved in this too. See, and that's what one of the things he's doing here. Now, if the law had replaced the promise, then the law would need to be that which gives life. You see, the promise gave life to Abraham. Spiritual life. But the law doesn't give life. So it can't replace it. If it were to replace it, it would have to give life. And so that's why he says, if, if the law would give life, then I would say, okay, righteousness would be by the law. But the law doesn't give life. What does it give? Death. <laughs> the law kills. That's what it's for. is to show us we're dead in sin and trespasses. And so Genesis 15, 6, he believed the Lord and they counted to him for righteousness. And, and this was based on God's promise. It was not based on the law because there was no law in that sense. There were, there were laws and there were God's laws. I mean, it's always been true that you're not supposed to lie. It's always been true that you're not supposed to commit adultery. It's always been true that, you know, you're supposed to do this and that and the other, even to keep the Sabbath. It, it's always been that way from the very beginning. But Israel needed to have that written down so they would be reminded that they were sinners against the holy God. And every time they read those laws, they knew, I'm a terrible sinner. I'm a terrible sinner. And every time we read them, we are nothing, aren't we? Now, point number two, verse 22 through 24, the excellence of faith. Verse 22 says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Now, see, now he's bringing the Gentiles in on it. <laughs> All have sinned or under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Uh, so all are under sin. This is what we call the universality of sin. It means everywhere, everyone, except Christ. He's the only exception. And so this is the purpose of the law. Again, Romans 7.13, uh, the commandment might become, uh, become exceeding sinful, that we might become exceeding sinful. And that it would become evident that all are guilty before God. Again, in Romans 3, in verse 19, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. A lot of people say, well, that being under the law just means the Gentiles. And mainly it does. But, you know, we were also under that law. We were not under the law that was written by Moses. But we were under the law that you're not supposed to lie. You're not supposed to steal. You know, that's always been true. But we're not under the written law. And so this, when it says uh, that we're kept under the law, it says that all may become guilty before God. And the whole world becomes guilty. And uh, the world may become guilty before God. The whole world may become guilty before God. Not just the Jews, but the whole world. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up into the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now this faith here, uh, I, I did a lot of referencing here because it, it's, it's a little difficult. But I've come to the conclusion that uh, uh, John Gill and a couple of others do the same thing. They say this is Christ. This is faith because Christ is the object of our faith. If we just make it faith the way we usually think of faith, you have a little problem going on with the other verses. So they seem to think it's Christ himself. That faith is Christ himself because that's where our faith is. And he's the object of our faith. And so the other verse said, till the seed come. This is saying till faith comes. And we were kept under the law. We were under the demand and under the curse of the law. We were kept in prison and in bondage to the law. And it says we were shut up to the faith that should afterward be revealed. That is, until Jesus was revealed. Until Jesus was revealed, all of that uh, could not actually be fulfilled. The moral law, the ceremonial law, that couldn't be fulfilled. We were under the curse of it. 
Now, God made a provision that those in the Old Testament who believed in him uh, had righteousness. They had righteousness even though Christ had not died for their sins. And so when the Lord says uh, that, uh, talks about the sins that are past, I think he's talking about the Old Testament sins before Christ came. Those sins that are past, those sins that are not actually paid for. They are in the mind of God, they are in the purpose of God, but they're not actually literally paid for because Jesus had to come and die for our sins, for our sins to be paid for. And isn't it nice that we can now look back on it and say, that's all already been done. It's all completed. We don't have to wait for Christ to come. Um, John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Lord being revealed. Now, verse 24, as we hurry on here. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us uh, unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Under the law, there was no forgiveness. It was just rules. The law, the law is just rules. There's no forgiveness in the law. Now, there is in the, the, I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. Now, later on, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself as, as in Moses' time. And, and uh, a lot of the things that we would think of forgiving one another is in there. But forgiveness is not in the strict law. It's not there. Um, Pulpit commentary says on this verse, the law, the law hath done with us the work of the child's caretaker with an eye to Christ to whom we have now been handed over. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. In other words, um, instead of looking forward to Christ or instead of depending on the law, uh, the law actually turned us over to Christ through faith because the law had to surrender its bondage to us. It's like handing over the baby to, you know, to somebody else. Or letting your child go because they're grown up, they're mature now, and you, you don't keep them in the bedroom all the time and, you know, and discipline them all the time. Maybe we should, but we don't. <laughs> you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who have grown children, and, and they still want to discipline them. They wish they had. <laughs> and I'm no exception to that. John Gill seems to think that this refers to the Jews under the Mosaic uh, economy, that they were wholly under the law and understanding and though the law taught them of the rules and regulations, it did not teach them simple uh, faith, the simple message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I actually believe it has to do with all of us and that before faith in Christ, each one of us is under the law to obey it. And we have, we're just like the Jews. That's why the Bible says more than once, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. You know, circumcision and uncircumcision, there's no difference. It's nothing. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. And so we're all guilty before God because of the law. Because of the law. Uh, now let's hurry on to verse 25 to 29 before my time runs out here. Um, expectation of faith. The expectation of faith. Galatians 25 says, But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. That is, when Christ came, and did everything that he needed to do. That is, when Christ has come to fulfill the law, neither Jew nor Gentile is under the schoolmaster. The law is strict command. We're not under the schoolmaster anymore with faith in Christ because Christ is the object of our faith and Christ is the one who fulfilled all of that. Uh, but we, have, we found a great fulfillment of the law in Christ himself. Romans 8, 2 says, For the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. And I, I, I think he's mostly talking to, to Gentiles there. In Galatians, I've come to believe that's mostly Jews. But in Rome, they were mostly Gentiles. And he's saying the same thing to them. Uh, the song, once for all, it says, Free from the law, O happy condition. Jesus has died, and there is remission. See, there's no remission in the law. There's no forgiveness in the law, but there is in Christ. And we need forgiveness because we're sinners against the holy God. Verse 26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's one of the simplest gospel messages in the whole Bible. Uh, you've got John 3, 16. You've got Galatians 3, 26. You've got Acts 16, 31 and several others. Uh, Acts 10, 43. You've got a whole bunch of... Uh, 
of verses in the Bible that tell us that we're saved by grace through faith. And that faith is what saves us. Of course, we know grace is behind our faith. Uh, so instead of being under the law, we're the children of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he adopted us. See, took us out of the devil's family, put us in his family. He adopted us. Because we are, were of our father, the devil, when we were lost. Verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, there's a whole great big war that goes on in this verse. Our Protestant friends tell us that that means that when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're baptized into Christ. That's called spiritual baptism, and there is no such thing as spiritual baptism. There is a spirit baptism, which happened on the day of Pentecost and the Cornelius house. But there is no spiritual baptism. There's a symbolic baptism. Can you be baptized with the baptism that I've been baptized with? And they said yes. And he said, yes, you can. But I, I don't think they could. I think he said that and referred back to water baptism when he said, yeah, you can. But I think he was talking about his baptism of suffering and death. I don't think they would have understood if he answered the question, uh, answered the question that he actually asked. Um, and so he said, but, so what does this mean? Well, I'm of the opinion that when baptism is used in the Bible, that it is used all the time in the normal sense, except when it's symbolic or when it's spirit baptism. Spirit baptism was just one event, one big event that happened in different places two or three times in, in the book of Acts. Uh, and uh, symbolic baptism is the baptism of suffering and that type of thing. But most of the time when the word baptism is used, it's water baptism. And I believe this is water baptism. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now that word into means in relationship to or concerning Christ. In relationship to him. Doesn't mean you're baptized into him. That would be salvation to a lot of people. You know, into him in that sense. And you put on Christ. Well, before considering this verse, we have to realize what verse 20 says. Just go back and remember, for you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So baptism has nothing to do with our being saved. Nothing except a symbol that we are saved. That's what it means. And so Paul was assuming maybe that, uh, and I thought this was the best uh, rendition of this, that he assumed that there were some people in Galatia that had not been baptized in water. Because he said, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Maybe there were some there who had not been baptized and they had not put on Christ. You know, you can be saved and not put on Christ. You know, you can be a soldier and not put on your uniform. You can be a policeman and not put on your uniform. And when you're saved, you need to be baptized in water to identify yourself with the people who believe in Christ. In a local assembly... So you can work for him and give glory to him because the Bible says the Lord gets glory in the church. Amen. Water baptism. So putting on Christ is an identification. You're identifying yourself with a group of people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and saved by grace through faith. Now let's hurry on to verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. Speaking to the Galatian churches, Paul puts their membership into perspective uh, to the purpose of God in church unity. He just got through talking about putting on Christ. When you put on Christ, you're baptized into the membership of a local church. So he says there's no difference in the church. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ. Now that is true in salvation too. We know that. But I think here he's talking about being a member of a church. Being a part of a church. And a church should be one. It should be in unity. And the Bible talks about that a lot. So they are all the children of God by faith. They've all been baptized in water to put on Christ. And they are to serve together in harmony. I think that's what that means. Now verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
Now, he's talked about the law, talked a little bit about the promise, but he talked a whole lot about the law. And now he says, now, if, uh, if you're in Christ, or if you be Christ, not if you're in Christ, but if you be Christ, if you belong to him, you belong to him because of the promise, not because of the law. Because of the, the, the promise goes way 430 years back before the law ever started, and uh, Abraham had righteousness because of faith, not because of the law. So, not only are we the children of God by faith, but we've also put on Christ, and we're also one in Christ. And now he says we belong to Christ. We belong to Christ. Everybody who's a member of a church should belong to Christ, don't you think? Galatians 5.23 says, And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. You're Christ. Galatians 5.24 says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If you belong to Christ, uh, you, you are to turn away from all of your worldly lusts and all of your worldly thinking and live for Christ. Mark 9.41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because ye belong to Christ... Verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. So there are three verses there, actually four verses, that tell us that we belong to Christ. You don't belong to anybody else. You don't belong to Satan. You don't belong to your parents. You don't belong to your spouse. You don't even belong to yourself. You belong to Christ. And if we know that, we'll serve him. So we're all um, in Christ by the promise. Romans 2.28 says, For he is not a Jew, which is one inwardly, neither that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of God, uh, not of men, but of God. So he's bringing everybody in here. And applying this not just to the Jews, but he's applying it also to the Gentiles, and makes everybody a Jew. <laughs> we're all Jews. Now, we're not national Jews. We are Jews in the eyes of God because we come under the same law and we're saved by the same grace, through the same faith, in the same Lord, under the same situation, and Jews and Gentiles alike should belong to a scriptural New Testament church and serve the Lord in harmony and unity together because there's no difference between us. We're all just saved by grace. Let's stand together and be dismissed.